Hi everyone. So, the coffin of Andy and Laylee is really, really fucking good. If you've heard of this game, you've probably heard of it in the context of memes, screenshots divorced from context, and or capricious moral outrage. If you've not heard of this game, well, you're hearing of it now. Good thing, too, because much of the coverage and discussion around this game that already exists has been, let's just say, not particularly earnest. I hope to remedy that at least somewhat with this video. If you've heard about this game because of discourse and come here expecting drama and hot takes, then this may not be your video. Or your YouTube channel, even. Or maybe it is, if you'd like the delicious comments section. If you're that sort of clicker, though, welcome. I'm Audrey of the Joystick System. And this is the place where I and my headmates talk honestly about things we care about. And I hope you'll hear me out a little, and maybe consider staying and improving our viewer attention. Thanks, if you do. So, to writ, my purpose today is to gush. I will be gushing here for most of it. And as for what I will be gushing about, some of it will be gushing blood, guts, and delicious death. I'm entirely serious. The subject of today's presentation contains mature content, including copious foul language and themes slash depictions of death, cannibalism, cultism, demon summoning rituals, parasite, dystopian social decay, and heterosexuality. Oh, and also a little bit of incest as a treat, I guess. But the incest is heterosexual, and that's worse. Excellent. You're still here. So, this morbidly beautiful game may not be for everyone, but that's good, because it is instead for exactly me. A short plot synopsis of The Coffin of Andy and Laylee might go as follows. Siblings Andrew and Ashley Graves are forcibly quarantined inside their apartments by the local authorities with no food and even less hope for rescue. Their parents have abandoned them. Absolutely no one is coming to save them. In order to survive and escape this awful situation, they butcher and consume the fresh flesh of some guy who got himself soul-vored by a demon that he summoned without a plan. This conspicuously carnivorous crime and their effort to cover their tracks puts them in a fair bit of a deeper shithole than they are already in. So naturally they keep digging themselves deeper by committing even more crimes, and in the process also dig themselves deeper into their toxic codependent sibling relationship. Which is going just great, thank you. Sure, Andrew almost killed his sister, but he didn't, and that's what matters. And she still loves him, so it's all good. This is, of course, a joke. First thing I absolutely love about this game is the writing. It's witty, intelligent, uncompromising, and just generally delicious. It holds nothing back in depicting the toxicity of the two leads and their relationship, resulting in two compelling characters whose flaws and few virtues perfectly complement slash exacerbate one another, resulting in a beautiful train wreck of a relationship dynamic that proves equal parts disturbing, mesmerizing, and hilarious. The charming, dark darkly comedic bite of the writing style also lends a lot of great character to the setting. This sardonically presented dystopian world is both richly detailed and fleetingly elaborated on, a commendable balance to have achieved in my opinion. The first chapter of this game is hilarious, not just because of the banter between Ashley and Andrew, which is terrific, but because it presents such a sharp satire of current your bullshit. As just an example, I give you one of my favorite jokes in the game. Huh? Good news once again. Some of you may have heard from your loved ones that there's been supply shortages in the quarantined households. Well, boy, are we pleased to announce that all of that has been taken care of. It has? Does it look like I'm eating right now? Yeah. On that note, we'd like to remind all of you not to enter the contaminated apartments. 
No, your friends don't need anything from you. Everything is taken care of. Should you still feel the urge to help, the staff will be administrating bullets directly into your brain as a thank you. I hope that clears things up a bit. Moving on to our next story. A brand new art museum will be- I probably don't need to explain the thing this is making fun of to you, but I will anyway. The situation presented in the coffin of Andine Laley's first episode is very easily readable as an allegory for how disasters that are a direct result of ongoing 2020's late capitalist decay continuously fuck people over. In particular, this scenario feels like a direct commentary on both the COVID-19 pandemic as well as the Flint, Michigan water crisis. The former obviously has affected way more people, but what both have in common is that they are crises created and exacerbated by malfeasance and or negligence committed in the name of for-profit interests, and that the response to them, such as there was one, has amounted to dehumanizing and marginalizing the victims while minimizing the issue, forcing the victims out of society's wider view, and being reticent to punish the individuals responsible. Just as the authorities responded to the water crisis and the worst excesses of the pandemic in real life, the authorities in the coffin of Andy and Laley impose half measures designed to further restrict the freedom of the dirty undesirables who bear the worst damages, while merely shielding the upper echelons of society from the disaster, rather than actually addressing or attempting to solve the issue. Most of you who lived through 2020 in the United States probably have experienced the frustration of being on the receiving end of this kind of policy. During the pandemic, the quarantine was supposed to protect us, but for a lot of people, it ended up doing quite the opposite. A lot of folks didn't have any savings, and couldn't get any since the employment market wasn't exactly on fire, and our representatives had to be bothered way too much just to put out a pithy economic stimulus just to save face. Not to say all of this has stopped exactly, as all that's changed now is that we're just living with this situation. It wasn't literally a cop outside everyone's door preventing them from going outside to not die, but for a lot of people, it might as well have been that. Never mind those who, you know, had no inside to retreat to, or were imprisoned during the pandemic and left even more unprotected, or thrown out by their landlord and so on. And, you know, the big chain grocery stores keep throwing out all the perfectly good unsold food, so they're already sending this message and all but these exact words. So that's why I think this joke lands. It's exaggerated, but familiarly rooted, and that's just good satire. It's a joke which feels lifted right out of Invader Zim, which I would put the coffin of Andy and Laylee right about on the level of as far as both the tone it's going for and the quality of its execution. Add a card to represent the overworked educational system. Now, add the dead weight of students like you. So, you can see, children, that our whole society is nothing more than a perilous house of cards. Destined to collapse under its own weight. Dead. The warranty on your desk has run out. Which, of course, brings us to the extremes that these circumstances push its characters and its plot. Too. Okay, so also like Invader Zim, the coffin of Andy and Laylee is hardly a polemic, nor is it a morality tale. Sure, there's social commentary in it, but that's just a nice side thing. It's not a story about the otherwise innocent victims of an unjust society who are pushed to do terrible things by circumstances outside their control. It is, rather, a story of terrible people who, both because of their character failings and the desperate situations they find themselves in, find themselves doing even worse things. Andrew and Ashley commit the cannibalism the first time, in large part because they kinda have to do it. No food. Cop outside their door, actively deterring them from getting food out of options. So they do it. They could probably be excused if only they were given a fair trial, which they realize they're not going to get. So yeah, it's understandable that they do it, and that they kill this one cop who very much has it coming, but they do not have to keep doing it. And gosh grief, do they keep fucking doing it. So many it's. 
they really do not stop digging the hole that they are in. Even the first time that they do the cannibalism, when they kind of really have to do the cannibalism, Ashley is just a, a little bit more excited about doing the cannibalism than she probably should be. I love this kind of delicious, edgy, dark humor. I love stories that go for it, imagine the worst possible people they can, and also try to make that funny. I love this about Invader Zim, that it presents a character who is unquestionably a monster, but also has relatable human desires, like wanting to fit in and being concerned about looking weird or abnormal, but has those feelings for very different reasons, and acts on them by committing some very despicable crimes. It really gets at a deep-seated darkness that I and a lot of other fucked up, traumatized queer people who were little kids when this show aired have, the catharsis of visualizing some of our worst intrusive thoughts while evoking the emotions that pushed us to imagine this kind of fucked up shit. <laughs> I've loved this kind of thing since we saw Heathers when we were 14. Heathers is an absolutely incredible film that you should check out, by the way, and about which we failed to properly or interestingly articulate our thoughts a few years back. Its lead protagonists, Jason J.D. Dean and Veronica Sawyer, are similarly relatable characters who have familiar feeling flaws and emotionally resonant trauma hang-ups, and also function as very toxic enablers of each other's worst traits, leading them to work through those feelings by, you know, murdering their classmates. Oh my god. I can't believe it. I just killed my best friend. And your worst enemy. Same difference. Heather's made us realize just how exactly mentally ill of a 14-year-old we really were when we were 14, and I love it for that. So... So fucking much. <laughs> that was ten years and change ago. We are still a mentally ill 24-year-old. And Andrew and Ashley Graves, if I had to sum them up, are basically J.D. and Veronica, if they were in their 20s, siblings, and also way, way, way worse. And I love them. So, obviously, Andrew and Ashley are hilarious. At least, I find them to be such. They're terrible, and awful, and amazing, and Ashley is such a girl boss. She is one of the most god-forbid woman-do-anything characters ever. Anyway, I've talked about the cannibalism, and the dystopia, and the characters, and why all that's good. I've forgotten to talk about the part where they evade an assassin, and also a host of other things. I love that this game has so many fun little optional interactions with NPCs, objects, and items that you can totally miss. I love how the narration hints at the solutions to puzzles by snarkily referring to things you can interact with as what their purpose is to the characters, rather than what they are. This quip about the mop that you clean up a murder scene with, the interactions that Andrew has with these cultists who suck at demon summoning, the excellent in-game art, and the brilliant visual duality of Andrew and Ashley's character designs. This line where Andrew is upset that life is so hard for them as fugitives from the law, because they can only find this one shitty motel that takes cash and doesn't ask them for their ID. And also the music, which is royalty-free music made by people unassociated with the developer, but is nonetheless perfectly suited for the game. So much of this game is stuff I find so completely brilliant, and I have so little to criticize that I think we'd probably be here all day if I kept going. So, let's spend a thousand-ish more words talking about the parents. When the coffin of Andy and Laylee begins, the protagonist's parents are absent. You can optionally find two early references to them early on. One, if you interact with the bed in their bedroom, and you encounter the shocking revelation that your parents have fucked on this bed. The second is if you interact with the phone, and the game 
dutifully informs you that Mother won't pick up, no matter how many times you call. You're probably less than five minutes into the game at this point, barely begun solving the first puzzle which prompted you to find nutrients to not die. And of course, this says about all you need to know. These children have been abandoned, but if it needed to be any clearer, the game later delivers unto you a flashback to prior in the story, when Ashley desperately calls Mrs. Graves for help after they leave and go move to a hotel, and later a new house to which the kids are of course not invited. And this specific scene, specific line here, fucking hit me. And I don't want to hear these lies about starving anymore. Emphasis mine. Even as Ashley and Andrew escalate the severity of their crimes, which gradually come to have less and less to do with their need to survive as the story goes on, I find it very hard not to be on their side at least a little bit, and this is easily the biggest reason why. I have had this phone call. Not this exact specific phone call, of course. Obviously, I've never been locked up in an apartment with an armed patrol outside my door whose job it was to gaslight me while ensuring that I starved to death. Obviously, my mom has never said those exact words. But gosh grief and fuck me if it's never felt like she has. She may as well have fucking told me that with all the things she told me I was lying about. Who fucking knows? Maybe she did say those exact words to us. And... We repressed them. I don't know. I am very not done working through all the bullshit that she gaslit us over. I have called our mother and had to beg her to pay for food. I have called her and had to beg for her to pay for our rent, while our parents were supposed to be supporting us studying abroad. I have called her and begged her to forgive me for daring to use just a few of the $30 our parents used to send to live with every month back then to buy a drink or a movie ticket or something. I have had to concede to our parents financially holding us hostage, had to go the last week of the month on a shoestring diet while waiting for them to graciously deposit another $30 into our bank account so that we could continue eating. I used to relish February, the shortest month, for being the one part of the year in which I had to stretch out that $30 the least. And once, I pleaded with our mother to pay for us to move to another apartment when the landlord suddenly kicked us out of the current one, abruptly and obligatorily switching gears from arguing with her to kissing her ass through our gritted teeth, under threat of our parents cutting off their financial support of us completely, abandoning us in a foreign country where we had no money, no job, and barely spoke the language. And one day, after I stopped dancing to their tune, they just stopped listening. Stopped even pretending to want to help. After 19 years of escalating emotional and physical abuse and neglect, they abandoned us. And one day, after I spent months working 10 hour days every week, Ubering food around for tips, sending my resume, filing applications, making calls, stopping into places to ask for work, all to no avail for months, and desperately plugging the Patreon page of this very YouTube channel, praying that some generous soul with money to burn would solve all our problems. All of this still wasn't enough, and wasn't going anywhere, and I'd run out of money, and was short on rent on the one sublet room we could get that cost exactly three hundred dollars, and I called her, and I asked her for help. I really didn't want to, I wanted to hear nothing of her again. And she said to stop lying, 
to stop bullshitting her that I couldn't get enough money or find a job. Not too long after, I swore off all contact with her, and eventually also with our father. But every time I have spoken to either of them since, I have made no secret of how I feel. Because if I get nothing out of kissing their ass, why fucking pretend? My family is not poor. They own their house. They own and leased out a second house. Their house is full of fancy IKEA furniture and various other niceties. They've renovated the place at least twice. They live in a nice, safe neighborhood. They have an attic and a basement. They at one point paid for multiple plane tickets for us per year while still refusing to let us eat on any more than $35, an extra $5, which we also had to beg them for. Our dad has a lucrative tech shop. All of this, and they insisted, while refusing to answer questions about their finances in any detail, that they couldn't afford to help us go to where we wanted to go for college, that they had no place for us in their house, that they couldn't afford $300 of rent to help us have a roof over our head for one more month. So, when I read this delightful jaunt of a chapter of The Coffin of Andy and Laylee, where Andrew and Ashley break into their parents' new huge house to steal all their shit, and Ashley says, this is some rich people stuff about their fireplace. And when their mom says, there's no room to keep housing you here indefinitely, and the internal monologue says, even though it's way bigger than their old house, it's both an entertaining mockery of the attitude of the typical American family, how first you're your parents' property for 18 years, and then you're turned out on your own to face the world without their support, and how the fuck are you supposed to live like that, to figure out how to live your life in the face of that, to meaningfully be a fulfilled person in that situation, especially in a time when, no, mom, I can't pay a college tuition on a waitress salary like you did back in the fucking 90s, you cunt. Even though they have an extra bed in their basement, and a perfectly good couch, and plenty of space for another bed besides, and a vegetable garden, and a kitchen, and all these other middle-class, petty, bougie niceties, the Graves' mom says, sorry, we can't keep helping you. And I read all this, and I think... I understand why Ashley wants to fucking flay these people. I understand why she wants to kill- I cannot tell you how much catharsis the ending of The Coffin of Andy and Laylee Episode 2 gave me. I cannot convey the weight of my gratitude that Someone out there validated my anger and my specific fucked up power fantasy with their art. I didn't even ask them to. Probably would have eventually done it on my own. But I'm so glad that someone did it for me. If I ever hypothetically meet an Emily somehow and have some cash, I will happily buy them a drink. Hopefully by paying this excellent game's $10 cover price, I already have. I know you're not watching this. But, on the off chance this reaches your ears, I just want to say thanks for giving me a safe, legal, regret-free, socially acceptable, non-violent outlet for the rage I feel towards my parents. Well, mostly socially acceptable. Wow. This game is not finished, as you may have noticed if you've gone to check it out on Steam. It ends on an ambiguous and open note, but in my opinion, a perfectly satisfying one. Nemli could disappear, absolutely, never release the proper ending of this game, and never make another game again. And I would not be mad. I've already got more than my money's worth and then some. So, yeah. I'm happy. Count me as happy kind of want to start talking a bit about the branches of the second episode. I want to say how it's a brilliant idea to have 
two separate story arcs for the two variations of this episode's ending, and I hope that's executed on as beautifully as the rest of the game already is. I want to talk about the ways in which Andrew and Ashley's mom is ambiguously humanized, despite being so obviously terrible. I want to talk about the dialogue Andrew does when his parents offer him a chance to make amends, and he has doubts if you choose to let him have them, and how I would probably also have doubts in his position, and not be able to follow through without my lovely evil cannibal sister pushing me towards the thing. I want to talk about this line where Ashley talks about why she likes eating people, and how it's so equal parts poetic and macabre and edgy bullshit, and that's a beautifully, such a beautifully balanced cocktail of emotion to nail, and Emily totally fucking nails it. I want to gush forever about this game, and I want no one to stop me. Alas, I will stop myself, and move on to the elephant in the room. The fucking... But, but that, uh, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you not? Ah, I get it. Huh? You fuck her. What the- Hi! Oh, that is disgusting! Andrew, she's your sister, for God's sake! I haven't done anything! What the hell, Mom? Then what does she give you that makes it worth all this? What, well, well, that's none of your business, is it? I knew something was off. How did I fuck up so bad? I'm the worst mother ever! No! I, I mean, I mean, yes, you are, but I have never! I'm back! Now, of all times! I got the money! Did you miss me, handsome? Did you? Did you? I want to die! Okay, so, I said I didn't want to talk about this, but... I'm talking about this game. I can't not talk about it. Yep, that's hot takes and drama time. So, not too long ago, Emily deleted their entire online presence. The Steam page for The Coffin of Andy and Laylee, which used to list Nemli as the developer and publisher, now lists Kit9 Studio. It is the only game to their name on the platform. A community forum post from said entity known as Kit9 announces that the developer, no name given, has decided to permanently and completely terminate their activities online from here on. I don't know exactly what happened or why they did this. There's a lot of people around who sure think they know, but in brief, as neutrally as possible. Nemli, or someone close to them, was doxxed, or at least sought out as a doxing target by one or multiple users of an online forum. Their supposed crime? Making a video game for degenerates. I don't know who did the doxing, I don't know what their motive was, and for my own sanity, I am not going to look. I am not going to investigate this further. I am choosing not to care. The most important and most obvious fact at hand here is that Nemli's creation has been met with controversy amongst social media users and about one or two hack video game outrage journalists who seem to have nothing better to do or say, and it seems clear that the doxing wouldn't have happened had Nemli not been met with this negative attention. And all because of this. Not the cannibalism, not the parasite, not the demon sacrifices. No, um, the one implied sex scene. And it doesn't even actually happen. It's just a premonition of a possible future event that Andrew and Ashley supernaturally receive. It's not particularly graphic, it doesn't yet go anywhere. And it's a short scene on an optional route that the game actively forewarns you about. You have to be trying to see it on purpose. Well, 
That's all true. It is indeed a minor and avoidable scene, and the discourse about it has absolutely poisoned the well when it comes to the conversation about the game. But also, uh, it's optional and not a big thing is inadequate as a defense. This is still content in the game that Nemily actively chose to put in the game. And even discounting this, the themes of incest are all over the game. Ashley speaks flirtatiously to Andrew at basically every turn. Even if you avoid this specific scene, the incest themes are not something you're going to just not notice if you're paying attention to the text. All that being said, it's not like this content comes as a surprise. The coffin of Andy and Laylee's Steam store page accurately represents the product, brother and sister, codependency and cannibalism. It's not as if you don't know what you're paying for and choosing to play. You came here for this. Most of the people playing this are here for this. You have to figure that if they are fine with killing and eating people, they're probably fine with fucking each other, or eventually, possibly eventually going to be, at least. So you'd think, except that many people seem to unironically believe that the cannibalism is more moral than the incest. Oh god, I'm doing this right now, aren't I? So, I get it. While I'm pretty skeptical of the notion that cannibalism is not as bad as incest, I do realize that incest is, at the very least, the more taboo of these things, and that a lot of people are more uncomfortable with it than they are with the cannibalism and the murder. To quote the one positive and in-depth review available in any media outlet at the time of this writing, from Destructoid, This aspect is undoubtedly the most controversial element about the coffin of Andy and Laylee, and I understand why. While cannibalism is a taboo subject, it's present in mainstream games like Fallout as an option for players. Having incestuous themes crosses over into Drakengard territory, and even then, no option allows Kame to reciprocate Fourier's feelings for him. So, yeah, I, 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 you know, I get it, I know why, however, I can point to a lot of things that Ashley and Andrew do wrong in this game. They are, as per the game's premise, very not okay, not as individuals, not together. Andrew is way too attached to Ashley, and Ashley is generally an awful person who is way too attached herself, and also all too quick on the draw to take advantage of Andrew's attachment to her to make him do what she wants. This is not a healthy relationship, and we're here for it. It's compelling. But I think it's worth asking why it's such a toxic dynamic. Is it because they're siblings? Well, not really. It's a dynamic that's specifically possible with them being siblings, but it's not because of their sibling connection. The actual reason why Ashley and Andrew's relationship turns abusive isn't because their relationship is abusive by necessity or nature, but because Ashley abuses their relationship. And she is doing this for basically the whole game. Like, it is abusive the whole time. It doesn't become abusive when their relationship takes its romantic turn. Does it become more abusive? Maybe. Maybe the romance exacerbates the abuse. I don't know, we'll have to wait and see what the next episode says. So then, why is the notion of them possibly in the future having sex the elephant in the room here? Before that, they do so many objectively worse things that cause much more harm both to themselves and others. Is that really so much more of a bigger deal than the murder and the people eating? Or... To phrase it Ashley's way, you played a game about mutilating and eating your parents' corpses, and getting laid is what you're freaking out about? Is the incest really that much more extreme, or are you just more disgusted with it? And even if you are more disgusted with it, even if we grant that it is actually somehow more harmful for siblings to have sex with each other than to do murder and cannibalism, is this the hill you're dying on? What you've decided is of such utmost importance and injustice 
that you decide to go harass some random indie dev who just wants to make a silly video game about a couple of siblings eating people. Does it truly make sense to let your knee-jerk moral disgust guide you to the conclusion that the creator of this game deserves to be persecuted for merely writing about and drawing a thing you don't like? Well, to answer that, we have to get into the question of whether or not immoral fiction is harmful or normalizing things that are wrong. Does fictionally depicting an immoral action actually cause harm? I could dance around in circles for a little while about the edge cases and certain writers who are publishing bad or hateful material in bad faith or fascist propaganda, which is of course always bad, or whatever other example I could use to qualify my point or list out an exception to appease the people who disagree with me, but I'll just cut right to the chase and tell you the answer. No! The answer is no! The thing about taboos is that they don't make us more safe. They don't protect us from bad things. All they do is protect people's comfort by silencing others who they don't want to understand and enable bad actors by keeping their victims in the dark and denying them the ability to talk about it. The only thing we end up doing by censoring stories about these uncomfortable topics and making it socially unacceptable to talk about them is make it harder to know. We deny ourselves knowledge. We deny ourselves a conversation about these subjects. We deny ourselves the ability to meaningfully understand them. We deny ourselves power, what little we have as readers, to understand, to critique, and to reason. There's a Tumblr post I really like. Well, a number of them I really like on this topic. But I'm picking this one because it's got a quote I really like. It talks about Lolita. That Lolita. And now, I have never read Lolita, at least not yet. But Lolita is a novel about child sexual abuse, told from the perspective of an abuser. It's undeniably an uncomfortable book with an uncomfortable topic. And it's not wrong to be uncomfortable with it. The author of this post acknowledges that. But they talk about it. They talk about how it shines a light on its subject matter. The how and the why of abusers and their actions. The ways in which their victims suffer. How it shows all of this in a way that it only could from the perspective it takes. And. I'm just going to quote them. I can't do anything else. They said it better than I could right now. Embrace disgusting fiction, and then fucking talk about why it's nasty. Now you have the power over reality. The Coffin of Andy and Laylee has been ridiculed, joked about, hot ticked on, made a target, drama over, and so on. But it's hardly been criticized. No one I've seen admitting to not liking it talks critically about why it's disgusting to them, or tries to understand why it exists, or who or what it's for. And this is most people's reaction to most media that deals seriously with anything taboo. I don't get it. I don't like it. It shouldn't exist. Get it away from me. I'm annoyed that the medium, the art form of video games, is valued so little by so many that this is the wide reaction when something like this gets popular. That the mainstream games journalism media ridicules it, and the creator gets threatened by an internet mob 
and it falls on the weirdos, and the freaks, and the no-name YouTube uwu girls to give it the serious consideration and recognition it deserves. To summarize, The Coffin of Andy and Laylee is, in my opinion, a very good video game. And on its behalf, I am mad at video games. Now, go on. We made it through the video. I told you the plot. You can probably stomach the plot. So, go, go, shoo. Go buy an Emily a drink if you want to. Or buy us, the joystick system, a drink. You can do that at patreon.com slash joystick or ko-fi.com slash joystick. You can buy us drinks in both of those places. And the important names are Elotantifi, Pigeon, Scimitar, and Tess. I've been Audrey. Thank you. Listening.